exciting. Uh, I'm always excited to be uh, amongst Democrats, and, uh, and really excited when we have uh, two candidates vying for uh, office in Berks County. I moved to Berks County in uh, what was that? 1996, and uh, it seems like uh, an eternity ago. And one of the things that was really sad about when I first moved here was the dearth of Democratic candidates. I would go into the ballot box and find that there were many times where there was nobody running for a lot of our offices. So it's really exciting when we have two people who are vying to represent us and vying and running serious campaigns. And so we have that both for the House race that we'll be doing the debate for first and then for the congressional race that will be taking place uh, in about an hour. So this is really exciting. Uh, the format for tonight is pretty straightforward. We have 55 minutes for each. Um, we have to stop at 7.55, so the less I talk, the more the candidates get to talk. Um, we're doing things in alphabetical order. Uh, the, each candidate has a two-minute opening statement and a two-minute closing statement. Bill, you get the opening statement first, uh, if we're doing it in alphabetical order, and you'll get the closing <coughs> statement uh, to go first. And then we'll alternate back and forth for the question. So if you, the first uh, question, you, uh, since you're doing the opening statement, you'll get the first opening question, and then both of you will have two minutes to answer those questions. Rosie is our timekeeper. Uh, Rosie has a, uh, a two-sided, color-coded sign, so we're testing your ability to memorize things. It doesn't say how much time is left, but it, uh, the yellow will be for 30 seconds left, and the red is stop. My job is to be uh, the timekeeper uh, up here and to say stop, and I will say stop. You can finish your sentence, you can finish your thoughts, I won't be rude unless you decide to keep going. <laughs> um, we have lots of questions already, and the blue questions, if you have, you have blue and pink cards, the blue questions are for this debate, the pink questions are for the following debate. So uh, we will take them if you set them up on the wrong color, but uh, we're trying to limit everybody to one or two questions so that everybody gets a chance. So all of that being said, as, uh, as we have questions, Dick, you're going to be bringing them up, right? Okay. Uh, Bill? Make sure there's no taser attached to that. <laughs> <laughs> but by way of introduction, my name is Bill Bispols. I'm a Kutztown resident. We moved here when I was in uh, eighth grade, uh, where I learned the Pennsylvania Dutch traditions, and the costume Mikafanga, and the, the trips <laughs> up the pinnacle, and, and eventually the uh, what I call the Dutch work ethic. I worked all kinds of jobs coming up through high school. Worked at the uh, folk festival for Little Richard. Where I led a, a labor strike, I want you to know. <laughs> we, we fought and got $100 for our week's work rather than 75 But uh, all kinds of jobs. The Glockenspiel restaurant, the Berkeley Country Club, locally the shoe factory and the foundry, summer jobs, foundry jobs, <coughs> Atlas, chemical. Uh, went to Bullenberg College. After college, I headed west to grow up with the country, followed Horace Greeley's advice, and spent a number of years out west. Again, all kinds of work. Uh, it was a ski, jo ski jobs during the winter time, you know, driving a bus and working in clubs, and then the summertime construction jobs. I worked with carpenters and stonemasons and landscapers. And I would never call myself any of those things, but I've worked with them. I know how the, how the hard work is. I'm stressing the work because I'm here. I really, what's moving me is the fact that working class people have been getting squeezed, is the polite term. For the past 30 years at least, it just seems like jobs are going overseas and everything is more and more pressure on regular working folks. And we've been feeling that for so long. And you can just name the issues one after another. The big one is property taxes. People who can't afford to stay in their own homes after working a lifetime, it's just outrageous. So I worked my way through law school. I'm still a worker, still fighting for working folks. That's why I'm here. I'm a, product, uh, I'm a lawyer in private practice in Reading. I represent corporations. Corporations have attorneys. You know, people have lawyers. And that's, that's what I am. And I'm, I'm excited to be here tonight. I'm excited that Joe's here so we have a chance to discuss the issues. I think this is a great opportunity. Thank you for all coming out. Thank you, Mike. I just want to thank you, Mike, for very moderate, Bill, for being here as well, and for the KABC for getting such a tremendous turnout. I'm very impressed by what you've done and what you've been doing in this area. My name's Joe Haas. I'm also a Kutztown resident. I uh, moved out here, moved in the area about six years ago when I uh, decided to go to school at Kutztown University, finished up my studies in 2008, and decided to settle. I mean, great place to live. 
I, I love being in Berks County. I love being part of the community. Now, I took an untraditional path to, to college education. I uh, started going to college full-time when I was 24, because when I was 18, we couldn't afford it. Uh, my family had a bankruptcy issue. Uh, they went through a divorce. Grant money was not available. I had to wait until I was an independent student at 24 until even something at the state level was something I could afford. And this is something that I, I realize a lot of young people in Pennsylvania are going through, and, and, and more so now than ever because we have a Corbyn administration that is cutting higher education spending drastically. 30% cuts at our state-related schools and 20% cuts at our state uh, system schools like Cookstown University. So I see young people who, who are thinking of going to college or may have committed to going to college who are terrified about racking up debt, about spending four or five years or six years to earn a degree that may not guarantee them entry into the workforce. And more and more, those, those degrees become less and less significant. Um, so I'm going to fight for higher education. I'm going to make sure that every person in Pennsylvania has the same opportunity that I did. I mean, as I said, I went to school when I was 24, finished when I was 28, working, very happy, uh, you know, to be part of the community, and I want to make sure every Pennsylvanian has that same opportunity. Thank you. Joe and Bill, if you're going to stand up to answer the questions, which is fine, just so you know, uh, after you answer, if you're the second answer, you'll be the first one to answer the second question, so you might as well just <laughs> keep standing, standing up, Joe. Oh. So, <laughs> and Rosie, since I don't have my uh, clock anymore, if you can tell me when it's 10 minutes before the hour, so we can say the last question. Or um, closing statements. Okay. Well, I... Little number at the top. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's microscopic. It is microscopic. <laughs> we already have some good questions, some tough questions, as you would expect from KADC. Uh, here's the first of those. The application of sewer sludge on farm fields is a big concern in this area. What would you do to address this problem? I, I will admit uh, wholeheartedly that sludge is not an issue to me. It's not an important issue that's facing this community. And I, I realize that that's not going to be uh, well received by many people in the activist community. But with our focus on jobs, with our focus on education, I, I think we get too mired in discussions about sludge, about fracking about issues that are really not affecting people directly in, the, in this community. Now, from what I do know about the sludge issue, yes, I, I do want to give more local control. I, I want to have more oversight to the practice, but it is not a focus of my candidacy. Um, I, I believe sludge is absolutely a horrible, horrible thing to see on our lands, and I'm not opposed to it. The notion that everything that goes down is sewer in Philly, in New Jersey, can end up on some of the finest farmland in the country is outrageous. It won't be the primary focus of my, of my campaign, but I'm very much opposed to the application of sludge. And the bigger issue here is local control. What, what the sludge people did, the Cinder Grove people, the same thing the frackers have done, is grease the wheels in Harrisburg. They spend enough money in Harrisburg, and local control is gone. When Lynn Township up here in Lehigh County, part of our district, the people get together and say, we don't want sludge on the fields. And they're told, there's nothing you can do about it. The state precludes us. When the good folks up in uh, East or West Brunswick Township, Schuylkill County, fought it, what, what happened? Tom Corbett, the then Attorney General, came in and told them, there is no such thing as local control. You don't have the right to stop this. Again, the wheels are greased in Harrisburg. That's outrageous. Local control is a big issue, and sludge is just one, one of the many factors where we get affected by that. But then, my personal experience, I don't see a yellow card yet, so I'll tell you my personal experience with sludge. One day I walked outside my backyard right here in Kutztown, and the nastiest smell I've ever smelled hit my nose. Now, we're, this is farm country. Manure is fine. Manure is the smell of spring. But this wasn't manure. This was a nasty, nasty smell. I found out that someone had applied sludge right out here by the by our water uh, watershed. And this is where I eventually met Dory Sicker and the wonderful work that she does. And uh, it won't be the primary focus of my campaign, but I'm very much opposed to sludge and for local control. You're gonna help jump right. that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure you don't look like uh, a jumping jack on John's video. <laughs> 
uh, the state pension system is a mess. What do you propose as a fix? I think we have to do two things there. The biggest problem is we have all these fixed benefits, and there's just not enough money anymore to keep that system afloat. However, promises made are promises we have to keep. And if someone took a lower pay, for instance, teachers, if they've taken a, a lower pay all these years with the promise of a good pension at the end, then we owe on that pension. That's a promise we have to keep. Now, going forward, will we be able to keep these defined benefits? Maybe not. You know, it looks very much like we're, we're going to define contributions instead. You, the, the, your employer will spend so much money towards your pension, but you're going to have to work out pension like everyone else. It's just not enough money. But again, I would not go back on what we've done. Promises are, are promises, and we have to keep those promises. But we're going to have to change the system. It, it's, it's just not sustainable the way it is now. And we're going to have to do something. Getting over to defined contributions is probably the way to go. And I agree wholeheartedly with Bill. A promise made is a promise that we need to keep. Uh, our public sector employees, our teachers, they have done so much for the state and have done so at compensation levels that they could have easily matched or bested in the private industry. But they work for the state. One of the reasons they did so was for a viable pension package. And yes, we have economic hard times now, but this is something we owe. This is something we have to honor. This is. You know, we have to act in good faith. Moving forward, as, as, as Bill said, and I, and I, and I agree, we, we do need to, to reassess how uh, pensions are uh, structured in, in, in the future, but at the same time, we want to make sure we may remain a viable employer for good people who want to work in the public sector. So to, to say that there will be significant reductions in benefits or pension benefits I, I think that's a bit premature. I, I think we're going to see economic uh, recovery, and I don't want to commit to something permanent that winds up making us non-competitive in the re in the field of uh, public sector employees. So I'm, you know, I, I worked, uh, I've done a, a lot of work in the last couple of years on behalf of public sector employees. I worked out in Wisconsin, the state senate special elections last year. This is an important issue to me, and I won't turn my back on you. Thank you. Oh, and I have to stay up now. Yeah, yeah, and one, one of these times, one of you will get used to it. And, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I know it's uncomfortable. Um, again, another hot button issue. Are you pro-choice or anti-choice with regard to women's reproductive rights? I am 100% uh, pro-choice. I, I, I saw the endorsement of Planned Parenthood, and I'm hoping that they uh, they come out with their questionnaire at some point. John, I'm looking at you, but uh, I, uh, I, I am 100% pro-choice. I, 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 I I'm strongly in favor of a, a woman's right to, to legally terminate a pregnancy. Now, I, I realize nobody likes abortion. Abortion is, it is not in and of itself a good thing, but it, it is a legal medical procedure. It, it, it's, it's one that, that many women, for, for whatever reason, uh, seek to overgo. And I mean, I, I think we're in no position to judge uh, the circumstances of, of those who, who seek out this procedure. I want to make sure it's kept safe. I want to make sure it's kept legal. I want to make sure it's kept affordable. And I will fight any proposal such as House Bill uh, 1077, the so-called Women's Right to, to Know Act, that infringes upon that right, something that, that puts incredible obstacles in, in, in the path of women who are, who are seeking, again, a legal, safe medical procedure. So to say, that you can go on your doctors and you have to be lectured about what you're doing to a, a, a fetus or a potential human life is, is, is something that serves no medical purpose, uh, serves no benefit to, to our economy or, or anything like that, but just makes it more difficult and more traumatic for women to consult with their doctor to undergo a procedure that they have every constitutional right to, to receive. So I will fight against that. I was happy that that bill was tabled. Uh, but we have to keep fighting, because if, if, if we have a Republican House, we have a Republican Senate next year, if we still, you know, we're still going to have two more years of Tom Corbett, they're going to keep trying with bills like this, and we need to fight them at every step. Absolutely pro-choice. No question about it. If a woman sits down with her doctor, there should be two people in that room, the doctor and the woman. There's no room for big brother there. There's no room for big government there. 
that's part of maybe called the libertarian leanings. I don't, I don't want the government in my doctor's office or my wife's doctor's office. I don't want them in my library, on the internet, on my telephone, in my living room, in my bedroom. We need smaller government. We hear all this smaller government talk, and then these same people want to go ahead and interfere in the, some of the most private and personal decisions imaginable, and it's just, it's just unexcusable. No one is pro-abortion. The best way to limit abortion is to be very strong behind Planned Parenthood and prevent the situations that lead to that. But the government does not belong in that doctor's office, period. Okay. No, <laughs> Do you support school vouchers, charter schools, and cyber charter schools? It's a more complicated question. I, I, I support some variations of, of schools, some of these ideas. However, it's very easy to see how people are trying to privatize the whole charter school thing with vouchers and immediately, what's it mean? It means suck public money away from schools that are already underfunded and stick them in these for-profit ventures. And you can already see that happening, it's wrong. But my children were involved in a homeschool cooperative. So I like alternatives. However, we didn't take any tax money. We got together and the parents taught the kids and it was a wonderful experience to see these little types, I mean little types, doing Shakespeare and things like that. It was beautiful. I'm all for experimentation, but we cannot do anything that takes money away from the public schools. They are already drastically underfunded. And these notions of, well, the vouchers, a lot of it is just smoke and mirrors for doing in teachers' unions, and building up for-profit enterprises, and I, I don't, I don't believe it. I know it's a multiple-part question, but my answer to vouchers, uh, charter schools and cyber charter schools is all no. I'm not going to use taxpayer money to, to finance these, these private enterprises. I'm not going to use the, the money that's allocated to students to have somebody send their, their children to private school. I, I think private schools uh, do a good job. And if people want to pursue them, they're welcome to do so, but they have to do so at, at their own cost. Uh, what we see with the charter school program, it's incredibly deceptive. I, I think the, the far right of the Republican Party has, has really done a good job obscuring the issue. So they say charter schools. Well, the school district gets the key. 20% uh, of the money that would be going to the student that was that was attending, and charter school gets there or 80%. So you're actually saving money because you don't have to spend all of that money to educate a student. You're still getting 20% you wouldn't have gotten. And what they ignore is, we're still, you know, the infrastructure costs don't go down. The classroom sizes don't go down significantly. If we have a charter school, maybe that's 50 students for a school district, maybe that's 100 students. But it's not significant enough to even, even cut one or two classes a day. So there is no cost reduction, and yet the schools are deprived of 80% of the funding that they would have received. So no, I am strongly against charter schools. I'm strongly against the fact that they're not as regulated as our public schools. I'm strongly against the fact that the teachers are not as regulated as, as we see in the public schools. So we don't even know if the teachers in charter schools have the same training and have the same qualifications as our public school teachers. And finally, cyber charter schools, completely reckless program. I, we, we try so hard to, or at least the Corbyn administration, they will slash and slash and slash any program that actually serves the benefit and come up with the cheapest alternative. And what we have in the cyber school system is, is, is something that's incre incredibly unregulated and deprives a student of, of one of the most essential experiences as, as, as a student. Interaction with their peers, interaction with teachers, interaction with people in their community. So, opposed to all three of those. And I stand up. <laughs> <laughs>